Hello, I'm Donald Leggett. Welcome to the latest Focus IR Investment Trust interview. Uh, today, we're interviewing Charles Gillings. He's the Chief Executive at Utilico Emerging Markets Investment Trust, whose ticker is UEM. Charles is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of UEM with over 30 years experience in international financial markets. And by way of background, Utilico is focused on four emerging markets megatrends. Those are the growth in utilities, digital infrastructure, social infrastructure, and the energy transition, all underpinned by maturing economies and the needs of an emerging middle class. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Donald. I'm pleased to be here. It's a pleasure to have you, Charles. Now, at its most basic, what is attractive about investing in growth-led emerging markets? And then why these four megatrends, which I mentioned in the introduction? So I think just first principles, there is still a growth dynamic in the emerging markets, and that's being driven by basic urbanization um, and the rising of the middle class. And having just been in Vietnam, where the urbanization rate is running at 40%, you could see a long tail growth um, coming. And you know that as the urbanization rate rises, the middle class grows, the middle class uses our or demands better assets, better infrastructure in terms of airports, connectivity. I think the other um, aspect that we've identified to help shareholders understand why we are excited, even more excited, if you want, about the emerging markets are those four growth trends. Um, you know, energy transition. Um, the developed world is focused on achieving renewables and carbon reduction, um, the emerging markets are no different. And they have very significant investments into solar and wind. Um, they have very significant needs in terms of transmission. You know, if you looked at somewhere like Brazil, um, most of the wind energy is generated in northern Brazil. Um, the population and the industrial base is in the south. They have to get from one to the other. So we could see energy transition for the next 10 years within the emerging markets. They are on a journey just as the developed world is. If you look at digital infrastructure, the emerging markets is behind in terms of their just data usage, um, digital footprint, um, but rapidly growing. And that will continue as they move further and further to, to if, if you want, developed economies. Um, and I'm super excited by AI, um, if only because to properly use AI, I think businesses will need to get further and further into the cloud. And the cloud means data storage. Data storage means data centers, communication, sorry, the, the internet communications that go with it. So it's strong growth for the next 10 years again. Um, that's a, a trend which will continue. Um, if I look at global trade, um, there's no doubt the friction between the US and China um, is unlikely to recede. It might it might level out, but, but I think the relationship between the two is such that ongoing, um, if you want, um, industrial manufacturing will look for a... a, a um, a, a production base outside China. That doesn't mean they will um, move out of China 100%. There's still a huge population that they can serve, but they will look on a on a basis of next investment to relocate. And again, having been in Vietnam, you can hear that story very strongly. Um, more interestingly, you're also seeing China shifting some manufacturing into Vietnam. Um, into Mexico. So there is a lot of um, long tail decisions which should give us a change in, in global trade mix and a change in the way trade moves. Um, and social infrastructure, there's no doubt that the emerging markets are behind in terms of waste, waste treatment and other aspects which all of us take for granted in the West. And that heavy investment government supported ought to give us a tailwind. So we look at it and and are, are excited by, if you want, the growth opportunity, but also just the, the sheer underlying growth within the economies. Okay, and if I could turn to one of the other macro drivers, 
uh, in terms of the global macroeconomic outlook, inflation appears to have peaked. So how has that affected the emerging markets? What has the reaction been to that? So no different than the West. I think if you looked at the emerging market central banks, while they were probably quicker to move to increase their interest rates to get ahead of inflation, which was running much higher than that in the developed markets. Um, the reality is that they haven't then reduced the interest rates as their inflation rates have dropped. So you, you're seeing real interest rates at all time highs. I think Brazil's real interest rate today is 7%. And all that tells me is there's room for the central banks in the emerging markets to reduce their interest rates. And we all know that when that happens, um, economies get become energized and also investors will switch away from fixed income where I think they've been focused for the last 12 months and rightly so. They've been very attractive returns. I think the next 12 months is going to be different, um, but certainly inflation has rolled over um, and in many markets is now at a level where interest rates should follow downwards. I think they take a lead from the US. Um, so to the extent the US inflation has rolled over, the economy looks as though it's starting to soften at the edges, we can all anticipate um, the, the US interest rates to be reduced. And I think the rest of the world can then follow. Okay, does that give you, you briefly mentioned there that that might give you a, a, a more positive outlook for stock picking and uh, uh, stock purchases? Is that how you see things? I think I see things on two levels. One, there has been a, a, a real sell down of equities um, globally as people have sought out cash um, to meet mortgage payments, to help families, to help their businesses. Um, and that downdraft, if you want, on the equity markets has seen the retail investor, if you want, step to the sidelines in places like Vietnam, step to the sidelines in Brazil. Um, so valuations are low. Um, and if you looked at most metrics, um, valuations are 15 to 20% below where the long-term trend is. Um, so I would, I would, I would think as investors step back into equities, we should see that valuation uplift. Um, and as interest rates drop, clearly balance sheets of corporates and the cost of debt for them starts to trend down again. So those two things, I think, are, are, are real tailwinds as a result of interest rate policy. Okay, let me turn to the, some of the other long-term global trends. Uh, trade globalization as a, as a trend has, uh, has ended. So I understand from all my discussions with utilico uh, analysts and people who know better than I. And defensive nearshoring and friendshoring is, is very much the order of the day. So how has this affected the way that UAM, UAM invests? the stocks you invest in, and if you could give us some examples of friendshoring, nearshoring, and how the very fact that you're across these different trends has, has, has changed your stock picking and the kind, of the, the kind of stocks you go for. So two things to note. Um, we've been consistent over time. Since day one, we're bottom-up investors. We're looking for good assets, good management teams, um, most of them listed, so over 90% listed, most of them operational, I think it's over 95% operational. So we can look at how well those management teams perform, how well the asset performs, um, and take a long-term investment. And I think one of my messages is we don't drive to have, if you want, airports in the portfolio, or we don't drive to have ports in the, in the portfolio. If they're overvalued, we, 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 we don't chase the asset class if you want. So our portfolio is an outcome. At the moment, I think if I looked at direct nearshoring, um, in the last 12 months, we, we've sold down um, Mexican airports. They had done particularly well in terms of passenger growth, in terms of, um, if you want earnings growth and 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 profitability, um, very strong share prices ran up. We sold down. I think we saw a little bit of friction coming in terms of the outlook on their um, um, regulatory framework, and so so we 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 have sold down. 
Um, but if I looked a bit further down in the portfolio, we're investors in a company called Traction um, in Mexico, and they facilitate um, both people, so workforces, um, and, 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 and most of the industrial facilities are out of town on business paths. And so huge workforce movements needed. That's a core piece of their business. They have a very strong logistics business, um, and they have a very good cross-border business between Mexico and the US. Um, and if I looked at the third quarter results this year, versus third quarter last year, revenues were up nearly 20%. Um, and profitability was up nearly 50%. So uh, if you want strong performance and strong dynamic, um, and across the portfolio, we can see when we're looking, especially at ports, um, the benefit of the shifts that are taking place in terms of trade. UM's top five country holdings include Brazil, China, India, Vietnam. You've been mentioning Vietnam. How have those economies performed in 2023? And what does the outlook hold for them in 2024? I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, to what extent is it the strength of the country? To what extent is the is it the, the, the stock of the business operating within these countries? But nevertheless, let's slice and dice and take it at a country level. So at a country level, um, I think Brazil is set to grow at about 3%. So nothing that you would invest in as a direct um, GDP. But if you looked at our holdings, they've done remarkably well. Um, because you can see the the growth from increase in transmission lines at Alipar, who who you know are driving a top line and a bo strong bottom line growth. So GDP in 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 Brazil three percent, GDP in in India is probably six and a half, GDP in Vietnam is probably six and a half, um, and those are you know strong dynamics. If I look forward, I think. India ought to sustain the growth levels um, that they've achieved. They have an election coming up, um, but notwithstanding that, I think they will will sustain those sorts of, of growth dynamics. I think Vietnam will, again, benefit from, if you want, the China plus one story um, and, 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 and therefore sustain um, good levels of growth. I think... China itself is, is 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 interesting. I've just been there for nearly uh, well, just over a week, and my observation would be that there are headwinds in terms of the property um, overhang. But I have no doubt they will work their way through them. I don't think it's fatal. I think it's indigestion, if you want. Um, but if I look at the new um, economy in terms of um, electric vehicles, EV, and renewables, they have invested very heavily into their capability and they're certainly leading the world in terms of cost of production for those, all of that. And I think that growth will stand them in good stead over the next two to three years. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that they can achieve a 5% growth rate next year. Okay. Which takes us to uh, the share buyback program, which you've been running for 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 you know through the year. So, what was the rationale for the buyback uh, program, and will it continue into twenty twenty four? Certainly, at these discount levels, it will continue. I, I I look at it in part as message to the market. I'm happy with our portfolio. Um, if we can buy shares at at these sorts of discounts, why wouldn't we? I think. Um, we, we we set a daily rate almost, and we're standing there daily, and 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 it's been a good investment. If you look over the last twelve months, you know it's our NAV. I think is up just over eight percent over the eleven months to end of November. Should be up again this month um, if we sustain where the NAV is. So good, it's a good buy. I think, and and therefore I, I expect the policy to continue next year. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, final question, Charles. Uh, why should investors add Utilico Emerging Markets Trust, that's ticker UEM, onto the watch list? I think a very simple answer to that. One, I, I believe the underlying portfolio is fundamentally undervalued. And as interest rates lower, those valuations will pick up. 
I think you can buy our shares on a 13.5% discount today. So you're buying that discount on a discount. Um, and in the meantime, we're paying a quarterly dividend of just over 4%. So I think shareholders should look at it. I'm, I'm expectant that markets move up and our discount closes. So shareholders should definitely look at it in, in the early new year. Okay, Charles Gillings, C uh, Chief Executive at U Utilco Emerging Markets Trust. Thank you very much indeed for your words of wisdom uh, today. That was uh, 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 really interesting, fascinating as ever. Thank you. Uh, for more company information and to access the company bulletin board, please go to the Utilico Investment Trust pages in London South East. And meanwhile, do follow us on Twitter. That's at underscore focus IR underscore or alternatively at London South East or register on London South East YouTube to receive alerts to more Utilico Investment Trust interviews just like this one. All that remains for me to do is to thank you for watching.